We're now joined via Zoom by Kate Stegerman, who's uh, with uh, Doctors Without Borders or Médecins Sans Frontières as the Access Campaign Advocacy uh, Coordinator in South Africa. Thanks so much indeed for joining us and uh, welcome to the programme. Thank you, Peter, and good evening to your viewers. All right, so this has been a, a, a significant a development that uh, we will be producing uh, vaccines on the continent. Um, what's uh, Médecins Sans Frontières' uh, reaction to this initial, uh, initial reaction? Well, first of all, of course, um, you know, big congratulations go to South Africa as being the country that was selected to host the first hub. But it's not going to be able to be possible if we don't have vaccine technology that we can produce. So one of the things that we're doing as Doctors Without Borders is calling on both Moderna and Pfizer to urgently um, and openly share the licenses to produce their messenger RNA vaccines. And we also say over and above um, having this hub that we also, it's important to remember that we still need the TRIPS waiver so that there aren't any intellectual property or other legal barriers to producing vaccines in the country. All right, so in the face of it, it's a great idea, potentially uh, uh, life-changing and life-saving, but you say that uh, we've got to be careful that there aren't obstacles that will make it hard for it to happen. Is that essentially what you're saying? Absolutely, and I mean, it's important that, you know, while messenger RNA um, is an incredible um, vaccine platform, it really can be made easily adaptable to new variants. Um, you can have... Um, you know, less investment going into um, setting up these sorts of facilities. Um, you can also basically um, produce a large number of them at, at a smaller facility. Um, but it's important that we also consider other vaccines. And for that, you know, the TRIPS waiver is really important so that if we don't have to go country by country and product by mm. product. And it's also important to realize as well, we have a lot of conversation and a lot of the discourse is focused on vaccines at the moment, but it's really important as well that when it comes to COVID that we also consider other medical tools such as treatment and diagnostics. Mm -hmm. And this is again where the TRIPS waiver comes in as per the proposal by South Africa and India. All right, and, and I think uh, I might have seen you say earlier in the week, transparency is quite key to this. Absolutely. Um, so we know that the way that pharmaceutical companies um, behave is that usually they're very opaque when it comes to pricing, but also when it comes to deals. Um, and, you know, we've seen that being problematic um, this year in particular when AstraZeneca had a single deal with the um, Serum Institute of India. And now when India had their really frightening uh, most recent wave of COVID and dealing with the Delta variant, and implications coming in that they would need to prioritize domestic consumption that has uh, you know, resulted in a severe shortage um, of those vaccines for the Co COVAX facility in particular. And we're really concerned about those implications for Africa. So we really don't want to see deals like that going uh, on. We want to see more openness and we uh, specifically want to see um, more diversity of, of manufacturers. And I suppose that, it, it, you know, it's, it has to also go way beyond just um, access to uh, patents and technology. Skills is going to be key to this as well. Absolutely. And that's something um, with this mRNA hub that, you know, is really exciting about how Afrogen and Biovac are going to be able to work together to be able to do that. And that would take a little bit of a burden, you know, off the people who have those vaccine recipes as well. So Moderna, um, I beg your pardon, Pfizer had originally intimated that they were interested in setting up um, some kind of a facility here over the next four years. But if, you know, this kind of a hub is able to say you no longer have to um, worry too much about the investment and the training, all you need to do is, is, is do a technology transfer. It really means that, you know, less time would be needed. As, as your reporter mentioned, you know, this could be done in between nine and 12 months. Do you know if this has happened in other parts of the world where new hubs have been set up and the kind of successes uh, that that has brought? For COVID, this has been a first one, and I think that's why people are so excited. 
Um, so as we know recently with um, some of the vaccine hoarding that we've seen and some of the vaccine shortages, that it really has been the developing world that has, you know, bared the brunt of that. And in particular, we know that the African continent has only vaccinated um, approximately 0.3% of those doses have gone to people living here. So to be able to, you know, boost manufacturing on this continent so that, you know, that can be prioritized for consumption is really an important step. And it can happen qu quickly enough. You said about 12 months, you reckon? Yeah, they estimate originally, you know, some people say six months, other more conservative estimates are 12 months. Um, we really don't know the details. We need to hear more, um, you know, what's going to be happening uh, with this hub going forward. But that's one of the fantastic things about the mRNA technology is that things can be done fast. Um, and as mentioned, what's really important, particularly for our purposes, is that um, without much further production and investment, mm -hmm. those vaccines can also be adapted to variants, which is really obviously important for us here in South Africa. Yeah, and South Africa, I think, has already proved its worth in terms of manufacturing capability, hasn't it? Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, and we have a good track record, um, you know, of producing uh, generic HIV medicines here as well. So as mentioned earlier, we, we really, you know, whenever we're talking about COVID, we do all get so consumed with this conversation um, about vaccines. Vaccines, by their nature, are complicated. Um, and, you know, it's really important to know that obviously being able to be at the cutting edge and being able to produce these mRNA vaccines is great, but we also have uh, lots of potential here mm. at Aspen and various other plants where we could be producing, you know, life-saving treatment when they become on the market. How does this roll out to the rest of the continent? Will other hubs then be built or how, how does it work typically? Those details are unclear at the moment, Peter, and please, you know, do continue asking those questions when we find out more from WHO and, you know, and from and from Afrogen and Biovac. We're really curious to know. Some people have said that it'll be kind of like a, a spoke, a hub and spoke kind of model. Um, so we'll just have to kind of watch the space closely and, and see, see what comes up. But it really is important. And I think, you know, uh, President Ramaphosa was very strong at the announcement of this a couple of nights ago, saying that really, you know, it's, you know that we are going to be prioritizing, um, you know, Africa in, in terms of who we produce these vaccines for. It's not just about domestic consumption. What I'm just thinking now, this um, TRIPS waiver, if that doesn't happen, what kind of impact will that have then? I think that we'll be in a really catastrophic situation. If we say, you know, right now we're sitting with huge shortages in 2021, it just means that it's likely that there'll be more variants that'll arise and we'll really not be able to contain the pandemic you know, as many people have hoped. And particularly we'll see in those developing countries that are seeing those shortages, um, really bearing the, the kind of the brunt of that. And that would be not only kind of morally mm. obscene, but it would be epidemiologically, um, you know, really problematic. What sense do you get from the pharmaceutical companies, uh, corporations themselves uh, about this whole process of, uh, transferring technologies, uh, uh, abilities, and um, yeah, waivers. Well, they definitely have been lobbying hard against the waiver. On the one hand, um, we know that you know they've really been pushing hard with countries as well. But luckily, when it comes to intellectual property and the World Trade Organization, it's less about what the pharmaceutical wants, uh, companies want, and how countries vote. So really, a lot of the pressure. Mm. Um, you know, that has been happening, has been happening on those ones as well um, that have funded these vaccines. So it's really important that we remember that. So when pharmaceutical companies come forward and they say, oh, well, you know, it's about innovation and, and, and the investment and encouraging that, we need to push back and say, A, there shouldn't be any profiteering in a pandemic, but B, there's been investment. So for citizens to carry on putting pressure on their countries. The oh. turnaround on, on the US, I think we really need to um, put our energy there because we can't have a lot of faith in pharmaceutical companies doing the right thing. That said, perhaps they'll surprise us and, and you know, voluntarily will be willing to do these tech transfers. And, and, and we hope that that will happen so that these hubs um, can be a success. 
Kate Stegerman from uh, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF, or Doctors Without Borders. Thank you so much indeed, and uh, keep going with the good work with the advocacy, Access Advocacy Campaign. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter.